So initiation is so important for a therapist to think about. And the problem I often have in the TA world, by the way, is the concept about rescuing. Yes. Versus yes. initiation. So many, you know, pardon me, some TA therapists might be listening and shouting now. But anyway, those therapists that talk about rescuing, oh, we can't initiate, we can't um, XXX because that could be seen as rescuing. <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode, episode 78 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the ever-present Mr. Bob Cook. So this one, what we're going to be talking about, Bob, I think is really interesting. It's understanding the importance of working with unmet relational needs in therapy. Absolutely. And just before I start on that, I I realised, and I was talking off air to Jackie, that I'm in a very yellow room because the screen appears quite yellow in front of me. But then she said, Jackie said, perhaps I was in this way, I was sitting underneath the light or not underneath the light. But either way, if it's if it's a bit yellow, uh, forgive me. But let's move on to the, the the subject. Now, you know, when people come in, when clients come into um, my therapy room or Jackie's therapy room or any of the therapy rooms, if you like, um, that they, they come with problems in life. They're usually about functioning, um, either themselves and their quality of life is diminished or communication has broken down with their partners or other people or friendships or work um and that's usually why they've come to therapy or they've come to therapy because of tremendous trauma and neglect or had a history which has not helped them be the way they want to be in life today um so they've come into the therapy room and if part of this when you do the formulation and the analysis uh therapists will be looking at how the past affects the present and when we talk about the past what we're talking about is how are how how we've grown up and how we survived and how we've adapted to get our needs met and how that has played out today uh with relationships friendships and in fact in the therapy room so we may so any therapist will be making analysis and formulations about that and one of the things i always look for is um relational needs in other words um when the person's growing up as the younger self how how you know has their basic needs for security for example for safety um for definition for uniqueness been met have that been um stroked or has that been accounted for because if those basic needs for security for safety for definition from a positive other for mutuality hasn't been met then we grow up deprived yeah and usually our mental health has been really affected um so i'm always looking for how a person has got by in life early on especially if those basic needs um for security and safety hasn't been met I mean, your job, <clears throat> I don't know if you still do, Jack, but you, you used to foster a lot of, you yeah. were a foster, weren't you? Yeah. And, so, so, you know, I don't know what age group you dealt with either. What I do know is that you will have attended almost automatically, um, hopefully from your own positive parenting, you will have been uh, very aware of helping them have a secure environment, a safe place to be able to play in yeah um ha- helping them uh be around people who've been on the same journeys as themselves um looking at um self definition these sorts of things and that's what i mean by relational needs yeah and then you will help them um meet help those needs be met if you want to put it that way yeah i think i was still fostering when i started my um psychotherapy training 
And I can remember feeling full of hope <laughs> when I was doing it because we learned that, you know, if our relational needs weren't met when we were younger, that through therapy and connection and all those sorts of things, that we can learn how to get our needs met as an adult. So it's kind of like filling in those missing blocks from our early childhood. Mm. Yeah, so relational needs, just spell them out again, the basic ones are for security. So when you talk about security, that means a person has a secure, safe place to be able to express themselves, to be able to feel safe to be themselves in, to not feel that they're being threatened or uh, persecuted or they haven't got a home to be in. So, you know, how that translates into the therapy room is that if the therapy isn't doesn't take place in a secure setting, that means where there's confidentiality, where the doors are closed, where um, the place has got a safe place in it for people to be in, then therapy won't happen. Yeah. Effectively, because yeah. the client will feel scared and closed down. So if a person has been brought up where they don't feel secure in just being in life, they will grow up defending against that. In other words, they'll grow up usually repressing part of themselves because they haven't been in a secure environment to allow themselves to be themselves. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, why I thought of fostering is because and this may be a, a miscomprehension, so just let me know. But when I think of people who be, you know, fostering kids, whatever age particularly, the children that you're going to foster by definition, and please tell me if I'm incorrect, are going to be people who usually have um, been in situations of perhaps high neglect mm -hmm. or situations where they've been abandoned or situations where they've had lots of grief yeah. or situations where they haven't felt secure or situations where there's been attachment ruptures is that yeah. right yeah 100 percent. everyone yeah mm -hmm. and you know we we foster mainly teenage boys that it was quite difficult to get underneath that because they would often come out fighting and it was misconstrued do you know what i mean a lot of it was anxiety and, and exactly what you're saying feeling unsafe so when you say when you say coming out fighting, I think you mean resistance to attachment. Yeah, 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 literally. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to be the one that is in control here. I'm not going to connect or get attached to you because you're going to abandon me. You're going to go just like everybody else has. And so, they, so, so their relational need for a significant other person is not there. Yeah. So, so they grow up in an alien world. In other words, what I mean by that is they've had to become a self-reliant loner and they've closed down and they don't expect a person to stay around and show them any um, care, consideration and love. So they fight against the attachment. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, so for me, consistency was... <clears throat> was what I was doing, you, you know, the, the same things over and over and just being consistent. And particularly, you know, I can remember with one, if I said I was going to be there to pick him up at half past three, mm -hmm. I literally had to be there at half past three or before. Yeah, so you are helping them meet the, meet the unmet relational need for a caring, secure, safe other that will stay around. Yeah. Yeah. Because if that hasn't been met, then they have real they may have real problems when they grow up uh and having relationships with other people, friendships, lovers, carers, whatever you like. Yeah. Because they won't expect a secure attachment yeah. relationship. They'll expect the opposite, yeah. which is abandonment and neglect. So they'll lack trust. They lack the base. They lack the basic relational needs to be successful in relationships. Yeah. So you're helping them meet a need uh, that hadn't been met before for 
from consistency and security and safety and loving from a person who stay around yeah this is what i mean when we talk about relational needs because if these haven't been met or attended to then the person adapts the only way they know uh how to and in your the way you spoke a moment how i see it they come out fighting in relationships yeah really they're fighting to be not in a relationship yeah yeah and you know, that's, I think this is why I, I love the rela relational needs because, you know, ultimately that's what we all want is our needs to be met, mm. you know, and being aware that we all have, you know, needs and it's how each individual goes about getting them met because our behaviour is different. So we all kind of display it in a unique way. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's very much sense. And I think it really translates into the therapy room. Yeah. Because if the therapist can think about the things we are talking about and think about the attachments issues and think about the ruptures to attachment, then they will understand not only the healing that needs to take place, but how to work with the client um to get a healthy attachment yeah now i think you only get that by the way i think you only get the healthy attachment if you attend to the relational needs that haven't been met mm -hmm. yeah because there's otherwise they come out very guarded in your words fighting maybe but yeah. you could also say those clients who come and presented very withdrawn very cut off fragmented parts of the self and healthy attachment with the therapist will take a long time unless the therapist thinks about i think these things in the clinical way we're talking here yeah and i i agree it's it's you know there's, there's a lot of testing goes on in the therapy room you know by the client that you know can i trust you when you say and you behave in a certain way because for me it's about, I know I said consistency, but a lot of the things around safety and security is about inconsistent parenting. Mm. You know, parents that dip in and dip out or that aren't emotionally available for you. That, you know, not saying it just happens with foster kids. You can live in a normal, you know, family, but yet your parents not be emotionally available for you. So you don't feel safe and secure. No. And if those relational needs aren't attended to, Mm. <clears throat> and we have a perfect ground for poor mental health yeah unfortunately yeah now it, this is really important for therapy it's really important for a therapist to think the way we are talking because they need to give the client a second chance yeah healthy way yeah and not see their behavior as um, pathological in some way. Yeah. For me, you know, one of the things I learned quite early on with the fostering is that, you know, often people use behavior as a way of communication. It's about looking what's behind the behavior, not it on face value. Because, yeah, with the fostering, there was a lot of hate and a lot of venom there but it's what's behind that what are they trying to communicate with me you know they are feeling unsafe they don't trust me you're right and one of the, the pivotal jobs for any therapist is to decode the language of the client yeah which can be really difficult because there's so many layers to it it's a protection <laughs> mechanism a lot of it mm. and of course but if you don't think this way if you don't think about attachment theory if you don't think about relational need theory, then it's harder. Yeah. You see, yeah, basically, it's more, it's more hard, it's more difficult for the therapist. Yeah. And like you said, I know you just touched on it at the beginning about you know what 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 we got recognition for when we were growing up. If what we got recognition for was, you know, by being 
you know, stoic and taking care of ourselves and not being demanding and not looking for our needs to be met, then that's the behaviour that we're going to show as an adult. 100%. That's absolutely... And, you know, I, 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 I had a pretty difficult history and I went into therapy myself from a very lost position um, at 34. And, you know, if I hadn't gone to therapy, um, I don't think... I would have had much chance uh, for healthy, consistent relationships. And I certainly wouldn't be the person that I am today. Yeah. But it took the therapist to have an understanding of the things we're talking about to, to really make the first steps to initiate um, the, the lost child inside myself. Yeah. So initiation. It's so important for a therapist to think about. And the problem I often have in the TA world, by the way, is the concept about rescuing. Yes. Versus right. initiation. So many, you know, pardon me, some TA therapists might be listening and shouting now. But anyway, those therapists that talk about rescuing, oh, we can't initiate, we can't um, XXX because that could be seen as rescuing. Um, well, I think I want to give a plea for initiation. Mm. That doesn't mean I don't understand the concept of rescuing, but I also think so many lost younger selves in the client, if you like, never get reached. Yeah. And the therapist initiates. Because I think initiation is, is really, really important and vital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise the client stays lost all the time. Yeah. If you can wait, you can wait forever for the scared child to come out. But yeah. if you you could wait a thousand years, Jackie. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. But it it's a way of, you know, encouraging self-esteem and self-worth and everything in the other person if we initiate the connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if it's only say, how are you? What's happening inside? I, just, I experienced you as quite quiet and I was wondering, what are you thinking at the moment or what are you feeling at the moment? And, you know, what's happening in your world? Just those transactions yeah. are initiative, yeah. are, are initiating or at least the potential of a conversation. Yeah. External one, I mean, yeah. as opposed to yeah. an internal one. Yeah. And for the client to feel seen and heard, that you that's goes a million miles in the therapy room if they've not had it in the past. If it, often it feels uncomfortable to start off with, but the mm. more it's done, the more normal it becomes, which that's what we want in relationships, to be seen and heard and valued and all those things. And the only big one is love. Yeah. The the relational need to express love. Yeah. Now, when I talk about love, I love can be simply uh, a caringness to say, how are you? What's happening for you? Yeah. Oh, where... Well, where are you at the moment? You know, it doesn't have to be, I'm going to marry you. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm talking about care, love, by intent, if not expression. Uh, they're, they're things which I hope anyone listening here will take account of in the therapy room. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it is, it's a build-up. It's not like throwing this all at the clients in the first sessions. Oh, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's going to be overwhelming for them. But, again, it's about being mindful of that throughout. Yeah, to have a clinical thought and to think about attachment theory, to think about unmet relational needs, to think about security, think about safety, to think about self-definition to think about permissions to think about mutuality to think about the expression of love to think about all these things perhaps the child never had yeah so we can think about how we can address that yeah it's it is an, such an important template for the therapist i believe yeah me too i i love the the relational needs and looking at you know the impact of not having them and how I know I said it earlier how 
uniquely we defend against that or adapt our own behavior in search of that that's a bit what you've just said that and the vain hope that there can be some positive connection yeah if you've never had that positive connection you know what takes place of that positive connection by the way is in as an inward longing that gnaws away gnaws away and you know maybe hope is very dangerous and wonderful world but i think that yearning yeah that desire for something positively different to take place of that you know that destruction inside is um is important yeah a therapist to think about yeah yeah and you know this is <clears throat> it's a need that we all have it's not a want it's not a desire it's it's okay. an innate need in us to have a connection to have this yeah yeah to sound have somebody to care about what's happening on the inside to have somebody to care about putting in place a safe environment to to uh put an emphasis on security to put an emphasis on what's happening for you at the moment and to help put uh, and to think about safe environments and then we can start thinking about self-definition def because if somebody has been if somebody has been defined by the other person all their life little self-esteem has gone out the window yeah yeah and self-worth and self-love and self everything really yeah yeah, yeah. you become a self enlightened loner because or you you know you said going out fighting that could one be one way but you've never been never been allowed the space to define yourself whatever that means for the clients then you usually actually withdraw yeah yeah and we saw that as well to me that was harder to manage as a foster carer than when they came out you know spitting feathers and, and aggressive and everything because at least there was a connection there even if it was an aggressive angry connection but when when a child completely withdraws and there's nothing it's very very difficult to try and make a connection well yes and i, I think it, yeah there, there's nothing or stroke and jackie there appears there's nothing yeah i think it's important for the therapist to always have in the mind that even though you know the lack of connection the passivity the appearingness of nothing doesn't mean there isn't nothing no no but i hear what you're saying because for i hear completely what you're saying because it, it, at least if somebody is giving you something like you just talked about then connection has a chance yeah if the client as a business well i'm not going to give you anything and withdraws so much into their selves connections are much harder yeah but i tell you the way through through is initiation 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 now of course i understand that the other person might feel that it's overwhelming overwhelming and retreat further but it's initiation step by step yeah yeah it, it's interesting because I, I was thinking when you were saying that about you know if if the person is completely withdrawn and shut down in the therapy room it the, the, the big step is that they actually came to therapy in the first place yeah. do you know what I mean it's because otherwise they wouldn't have made the appointment they wouldn't have turned up so there's, there's definitely a you know a feeling of, of need and want for connection for them to do it mm. absolutely absolutely there is yeah it's such yeah. an interesting topic it really is and and like i said it's it's you know for me it's about the hope that it can you know the building blocks can be put back in place over time oh you know 100 percent they can but there needs to be the i believe there needs to be the motivation 
energy and desire by the therapist yeah. to go the extra mile and not yeah. give up on the yeah because it's not about us in the therapy room no do you know what I mean sometimes it is really difficult when you're not getting anything back from a client you know that you're racking your brains and take it personally and all those sorts of things but I, we've got to get our ego out of the way because it's not about us in the therapy room mm. you couldn't have said a more wise sentence construction and even though it takes me a long time and I, to move my ego out you are totally correct because um Unless I can do that, uh, what I mean by that is not making assumptions. Yeah. For example, um, checking things out with what's happening with the other person. That's the way forward. Yeah. What an interesting conversation, Bob. Yeah, and you know, it's probably, I just hope people listening um, can reflect and think about the template we're talking about because. It, it it will really be in service of the client, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think attachment theory and relational needs. Um, I know Richard Erskine, who I was trained by a lot um, in my later years, um, talks a lot about relational needs and has written a lot about a specific relational needs, which I've mentioned on this podcast. And if you put Richard Erskine, you'll, we've written nine books and many of them talk about relational needs but you know within that is also attachment theory and without thinking about templates this way then you won't you'll you you will feel like i don't know what templates you would think about but thinking about attachment theory and think about relational needs gives you a, a different perception of way of thinking about things yeah um in service of the client which is what we're talking about here um, yeah and it's the basic of very like you know from the moment we're born it's all about getting our needs met that's you know literally it's from the minute we pop out that's our sole purpose yeah. in life to that's survive correct. and get that's, our needs met you are correct and it takes two yeah yes that, that is the important part yeah that is the important part. I've watched many of Richard Attenborough's programs. I think the one at the moment I'm watching is called Frozen Planet Two. Yes, yeah. And it, it was what it was about the Arctic. It was about how, you know, babies survive in the most amazingly hostile conditions. But, and this is it, they don't survive without the help of the mother and the father yeah. in some ways. Now, if the same, so we've transferred to what we're talking about here, the baby comes out, and yes, for mental health, for all the things we're talking about, emotional health, we need the significant other people to pay attention, care and love and everything as we've been talking about so the baby can thrive. Yeah. If some of those processes are missing, the client adapts to attempt to find those needs to be met in some way. If not, they'll go inside, protect themselves, and part of their own vitality and emotional health will be severely damaged in life. Yeah. Yeah. It is, and it, it, it's it's so important, like you said, you know, if you have this at the back of your mind. Mm, mm, mm. And, you know, I, I completely agree with what you were saying earlier on about, you know, initiation slash rescuing. Mm. You know what I mean? Is that a, a healthy thing to do in therapy or not? And I'm 100% with you on that. Mm, mm. Wonderful podcast. Yes, Another one. You do come up with some wonderful titles. Well, I've got the I next think... one here. We're quite organised. <laughs> I'm laughing because often, often you you end these podcasts saying, "What are we going to talk about next, Bob?" Oh, well, I know. Uh, I, I will have it as a surprise. So anyway, let's cut through that. What is the next one? The next one is therapy, past, present, and the future. 
Oh, wow. I've said <laughs> that's a, I must say it myself, that's a wonderful title. <laughs> <laughs> They're all wonderful, and you come up with every single one of them, Bob. Yeah. I just like that one anyway. Yeah. So that's what we're doing, episode 79, Therapy Past, Present and the Future. Did I hear that correct? Did you say 79? 79. Well, my God. I don't know when we actually started these podcasts, but that's that's I, I'm, quite pr- I'm quite proud of us there. Shall I tell yeah. you when we started it? When was it? It was 79 weeks ago next week. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm even more proud of ourselves. Then. Yes, yes, it is. Right, until next time, Bob, thank you so much. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Take care. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.